What's up, guys? Josh Payne here from 24-7 Sports, joined by a very familiar face. You don't have to have the introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. He is a former Oscar winner. He is a 1993, in case you can't tell by the T-shirt, University of Texas at Austin graduate. Matthew McConaughey sitting in his house because he can't go anywhere else. Brother, how are you doing right now? We're doing good. Relatively speaking, man, we're having a pretty solid pandemic over here at the McConaughey house. We got a roof over our head and we got food on the table and we got my mom here and the whole family. So we're taking care of ourselves. How about you? I'm well, all right. I'm going to classify myself as all right. But I mean, you know, you joke about that stuff, but I mean, I'm sitting here with a job. I got food in here. I no. don't have anyone close to me that suffered from this. So it's, you try and make light of it, but at the same time, man, it's, I'm not in a bad place at all right now. No, and I think, I think we got to respect those positives if we're in a position to, because there's a lot of people out there, man, that are out of work, that needed, need to go to work, you know, tomorrow to pay their rent at the end of the month. Uh, there's a lot of people stuck at home with three kids that are out of school and don't have the means to go online and, and, and go to school. And so, yeah, we can all use a little, little patience and perseverance this time. So I, I want to start off with this. I was... I was in a meeting. I was on a Zoom meeting, actually, not too different than the one we're on right now the other day, scrolling through my phone, as you sometimes do on Zoom meetings, and I see this video that you've posted on all your social accounts. I can't turn the volume on, so I just watched it on mute, and the body language looked encouraging, so I said, I'm going to screenshot this, remind myself to watch it a little bit later, and it was you acting as the Minister of Culture at University of Texas should, yeah. kind of sending out a positive message to the university, and what I want to ask you is, a lot of people have done that, but they've done it in kind of like a token fashion, whereas you have completely dived headfirst into accepting a pretty big role in all this. Was that just natural or, I mean, did something move you yeah. to do that? It, it was just natural. I mean, look, it, uh, these are things that, I, that wake me up at three in the morning. These ideas, things that I put in that video, how people are doing, how I'm doing, sharing the best way I know how uh, to, 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 uplift some people at a certain time, particularly with the University of Texas in that case, and the students and the faculty and the people at home. It's an unprecedented time where people are confused. Um, when they can hear a voice maybe from someone like me saying, hey, I'm in it with you. I get it. A little, you know, a little vote of encouragement, maybe a vote to say, hey, this is gonna, it's gonna pass. We don't know when. Let's hunker down right now and really be resilient and not, not, not give up too quick. If they can hear that from me, and they go, yep, McConaughey shoots it straight. He's around right now. He's around when we're winning. He's around when it's tough. He's around when we're losing. I mean, with the University of Texas, I'm, I'm, I'm around at win, loss, or draw, you know, in any, in any situation. And obviously, na uh, national-wise, you see me at, at, at sports games, at, on the football field, et cetera. Well, we got no sports right now. Mm. But we still got all the athletes and everybody wanting games. So how are we doing in this in this – you know, this forced winter we're in when everyone's sitting at home. So if I can go on and talk to them, it's a way of me staying connected. And if I can help someone out and help them last another day, another week, there we go. What is, uh, what's your personal day-to-day -day been like? I know before we came on, you talked about getting in some really good shape right now. At least yeah. you found time to do that. Well, so here we go. I mean, I'm pretty damn busy through the day. I got three kids, as you, as you might know. Um, we get going pretty early. They got, they're doing online school. I come in, do some writing, uh, sort of read over the news to sort of see what I call the state of the union. Where are we specifically right now right. in this pandemic and what may be a possible message or PSA that I can make, that I can put out at the end of the week. And it's a moving, it's a moving target. You know, it started off a month ago, stay at home. Had to get that message out along with others. Then it turned into wear a mask. Um, I'm putting together, I'm finishing a, a, a new PSA for wearing a, ba a bandana or a mask that I did. It's all in Spanish. I, I called my, my friend uh, Canelo Alvarez. And right now there hasn't been a voice that I've seen to the Hispanic community right. about the safety of wearing a mask. So I called him, wrote him some stuff. He shot his end. We're editing that together and we'll be putting that out um, early next week. So it's sort of, I'm just daily writing, spending time with my kids. We cook a lot, we clean a lot more. I know my pets a lot better than I do, <laughs> man. I actually know, I know where the fuse box and the main water line is on the property now too, which I didn't know before. So I'm gonna get to know the property, uh, explore, write, read, 
work on PSAs, hang with the family, cook together, clean up, and then we all uh, gather together and we've been watching some Modern Family, which my eldest son turned me on to. I've never seen it before. That's our nightly ritual before bed. We grab two episodes of that. What, uh, what's been on the grill for you lately? A lot of beef, baby. Yeah, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of beef. We got went and got a lot of a uh, lot of ribeyes before the uh, quarantine and froze them. Um, so we're doing that quite often because um, I because I got I bought a bunch and I froze a lot. Smart man, very smart man. Look, I'm in the college football world, so all people want to talk about right now is when's college football coming back? You're gonna yeah. have people in the stands, and I want to get that on the table in a second. But in your world. In Hollywood, I mean, when you talk to other people in the industry, what's the what, what's the kind of undercurrent right now? What's everyone talking about there right now? Good, great question, and that's sort of what we're talking about. What is the same thing? The same position college football's in. I mean, we don't know when. When are we going to go back to look? When are crews going to go back with 120 people and relocate in some destination around the world and make a film? Um, yeah, we don't. We don't know. Um, Look, uh, there's a lot of companies that are just trying to stay and keep as many people working as possible, giving some pay cuts, but trying to keep people with a job for as long as possible until it's safe enough to go back out and start working again. Uh, we're, we're on a pause. No one has the answer in our industry either right now. Yeah. Uh, my hope is that during this time, some really interesting creative ideas, we may have a golden age of good art coming out after this time. You know, with, the, with, with college football, which you, which you cover, we don't know. I mean, it seems to me, and you tell me, you may know, know more than I do, but that the season, at the very least, at the best scenario, it would be pushed, and you start, what, in the fall? I think so, man. I, <clears throat> the way I've looked at it, and listen, a lot of athletic directors who you're used to going to as being these fountains of information, mm. they tell you something, then you kind of see them go, at the very end, so I mean... What, well, you, they the don't know. We all, we're all hoping for it. You know, yeah. it's like hell, all of society, everyone wants to go back to work. Is it the safe time to do that? Are we going to have games? I don't, I don't know. I don't see, do, do, I don't see a hundred thousand people feeling good about gathering together. I don't know. Let, we're going to play it. Is that going to be in the fall? Is that going to be this year? That's a tough pill to swallow right there, but it could be a reality. Will they have games without crowds? Um, that could be a possibility I've heard of. Um, you know, and you know, it's interesting right now to talk about college football with, 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 with UT. This is sort of like, remember the strike? Was it uh, like 86 in the NFL? Oh, yeah. Like suspended season. The Redskins yeah. went on to win. Uh, but it was a mental game more than anything that season. And coming out of this with the disruption that all of these players and coaches and lives have had, it's going to be the mental game coming out whenever the season does resume. The mental side is going to be more important than ever before. Also, what are these athletes doing during this time? Which, which team, you know, I was talking to, to our team, but be ready, do what you can now to when we do come out of this and it's time to play, come roaring out of the gates with it. Be ready, keep yourself mentally, spiritually, physically ready to come out as close to where you were or where you ought to be. Don't use this time to get lazy. You know what I mean? Because it's going to resume when it does come out of the shoes running. Dude, I think what you said a second ago about how some relatively tough times maybe in your world will lead to some really good art on the back end. Yeah. You circle it back around to college football. I talked about it on one of the shows we had the other night. Some programs are sitting around right now and they're developing terrible habits, but there are staffs somewhere that are coming up with new ideas they've never yeah. had to implement before. And five years from now, they're going to yeah. be folks who have revolutionized their athletic departments because of what they were forced to do right now. I don't think it's much different, honestly. Disruption does that. I mean, it's going to, it, it's forced to change. It's forced to weigh a different way of looking at how do we, how do these coaches communicate with these young men and women during this time? How do you, how do, how, how do they, these teams virtually stay together and keep a central theme going through this time when it feels like you're just lost in, a, in limbo in a forced winter. How do you keep a momentum and a, and, a, and, and, and a collective during this time when it's when it's when you're not able to get together and bond and form the team the teamwork that you would by working your butt off every day with each other? Um, there's a way to do that. Again, it's going to be much more mental now 
than at any other time. And the teams, the coaches, the organizations that are doing that the best right now, the players that are doing that the best right now, I think are going to have a, a, a big advantage when it's time to, to get that pigskin moving again. Well, when it does get to moving again, let me ask you a broad question here. You take it anywhere you want to. Where is Texas football, 2020 and beyond? Where are they at right now? On the way. On the way. Definitely on the way. And, you know, where are we? Uh, are, are we, have, are, we, are, we are not in the national champion title conversation until we are. Mm -hmm. Period. I'm, I, forget the hype. Forget the talk. Forget it all. No. No. We're not until we're there. And so we can talk about it. One of, the, one of the great things about the University of Texas, the expectations are so high here, not only from us, but from the rest of the world, all right? So we're the first team that people talk about. This, this great narrative that's gone on, is Texas back, is Texas back? Well, that narrative started before we started it, all right. you know? Do we have to answer the question? Yeah, you can verbally answer the question. You know where the question will be answered is on the football field. We know that. We got to keep, we, the, the better we do at keeping that outside chatter of expectations outside and say, you can ask us when we're back, you can want us to be as great or as bad as you hope we, we can be. But we know that we've got, we're, the, we're, we're, you see those numbers about how many teams, we're their number one rivalry. Yes, and, sir. and it's like 11 and the next is Notre Dame with four. Mm -hmm. So the expectations, people can love us the most and hate us the most. Great. What we got to do is find our spot right there in the slipstream where it doesn't matter. We're not doing it. We're, yeah, we're playing for it. We, we want to play for the people that, that want us to win, but we're playing for us. We're playing for the University of Texas. We will march through. When we get it in our minds to march through an entire season, that one game is just a battlefield on the war of an entire season. And we'll be there when we look up and we hold up a trophy. That's when we're back. See, you said expectations are a great thing there. I actually agree with you. And I, to be Bluntly honest, we cover a lot of programs where the expectation's high, but the investment's mediocre. And so to yeah. me, that's unfair. Places like Texas. Reason I've never had a problem with sky high expectation is because everyone's bought in. I actually, tell me about the game day atmosphere there. I know since Chris Del Conte has been in there, there's been a big movement to improve Absolutely. game day atmosphere. And it's, I haven't even been to a game in Austin in the last several years, but it's noticeable to me just on TV. It is. No, and Del Conte, let's point this out. This, this, this guy has done a great job at sort of re-energizing and, and rejuvenating that game day experience, not just for uh, men's college football, but across all the sports yeah. at the University of Texas. Um, he's put a, a, a bolt of energy into our school, into the state. Uh, our expectations are extremely high, and he's come in and said, you're damn right, as you just said, expect that. Expect that and own that. Own those expectations. If you're coming here, that's what you're going to get. That's part of the bargain of coming here. The highest expectations or nothing. Uh, that's part of the pressure. Do you love that pressure or do you fold under that pressure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you got to love that pressure. Now, you can say that. Saying that and doing that is two different things. The, the game day uh, experience, one thing we, he did that I really liked is early on, the stadium experience at Daryl K. Royal on Saturday – for a while, years back, started to have too many mixed messages. There was too many advertisements coming from here, and there's a cookie being sold here, and a gorilla over there, and it was like, who get day? There's one animal should be in this state. That's a longhorn, and there's one color, and that's burnt orange, and it bleeds needs to bleed. That's the baseline that needs to bleed through this stadium the entire day, the entire week, the entire year. Nothing else. We're not for rent. Um, so he really simplified some things and brought it in. And, and as I use the term baseline, which is the heartbeat of the University of Texas. And it's much more clear now. And he just sort of, he shined a light on it and resurrected it and made sure that it was on top of everything and nothing else interrupted. And when you're, when you're coming on game day or you're around here through the season, any season around campus all year, you know where you are. You know what the only game in town is. You know what you got to do. Love it, man. So... I think this is something about you that some people may not know. I think most people in Austin and around the Texas community know you're active there, obviously, but you're active on campus and that you teach a film class right now. Yeah. Now I heard yeah. Sean Colbert the other night talking about it <clears throat> and the actual, the guts of the class, the nuts and bolts. Walk me through what that class is about. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's just for show. There's a lot going on there. Oh no, it's not for show. Hell, it's the class I wish I would have been able to take when I was at film school here. It's the class that I think every film student, anyone wanting to make films or tell some form of storytelling should take. It's called From Script to Screen. So I've been active for 28 years. 
And over that time, it became very apparent how different the final product, that movie you see on screen that I'm in or on TV, how different that is from the original script. Vastly different. You would recognize that, there, that, that, that it started with that original script, but, but major changes, budgetary cuts. So this storyline, this great ending of the movie that was this sort of this big action chase that you loved when you read the first script. Well, we got to cut it because it was going to cost $3 million. And we decided to put that spin somewhere else in the budget in the making of the movie. Uh, rewrites. So what we do in the class, we give them the original, say it's from a book. We give them the book. Film students, they read the book. They declare what movie would they make. We then give them the first script. They then get up and say, wow, all this stuff changed. Where's all that stuff that's cut from the book that I like? We then give them the next script and the next script and the next script, then the shooting script. Now, major changes have happened. So they're seeing the science behind the magic of movie making. Then we show them the film, vastly different than even the shooting script was. So what it does is it gives them the science to the magic of movie making in a very practical, practical, experiential way. It also takes the pressure off of a film student from thinking they gotta know everything. And that original script, it must stick just to that script. It has to be that, which isn't how any art's made. Uh, you have a plan, yeah, just like sports. You have a plan that you're going out with, but you got to call audible sometime. You got to find room for inspiration. You got to get the ball of the person who's got the hot hand and go with that storyline. Um, and so you have to be in the moment, and that's just how making movies, just like sports, is is created. Yeah, you've come out with a plan, but how you get to the end, you have to be in the game, and and you call audibles along the way, be inspired along the way, tell the best story that you can, being inspired along the way. Do you ever watch your, let's say, let's say a movie you did in 1994, pick one. I mean, do you sometimes watch your material as if a player watching his old film would critique himself? Do you ever do that? Or you just no. let it be what it is? No, it is what it is. I mean, if, I, if I'm flipping through channels or something, I'll, use, I'll pause for, and then I'll skip it. I'll go, yeah. I'm, I mean, <laughs> for me, I'm like, look, I did it. I know what, I, I can still to this day, I mean, I have a memory of the, the, I can go all the way back to every film I've made, I've made over 50. I can, you, you, you could put me in any scene or recite any scene, and I remember exactly where I was. I know what take, it was take four they used right there. I remember it because it felt great, it was true, and I remember the director going like this. I, somehow I remember every single take I've ever done and which one was used, so I don't need to go rewatch it. Do you, um, I'm not gonna ask you if you remember it, of course you remember it, one of my favorites of yours that I don't hear talked about as much, even though it was big at the time, was Two for the Money. Two for and the Money, like, yeah. Yeah, man, for people who haven't seen it, it's, it's a really high budget deal. It's got Pacino in it, it's got Rene Russo in it, it's got you, Jeremy Piven, I think, is in that movie. Yeah. It's about sports betting. Yeah. And I always think, and I was thinking this morning as I was getting set up for this, it was big when it came out. But now that sports betting's been legalized, I wonder if they dropped that thing in 2020 or 21 or even like made a series about it, I wonder how much different it would be received by the public. I loved it at the time because I got the subculture of sports yeah. betting at the time. But what are some of your memories of that project? Well, one, work with Pacino. Great. Yeah. I mean, there's one of the legends in, in my craft right there. To hear him tell stories of working on The Godfather, to hear him talk about an actor who stands up for his rights and it, hook or by crook, it doesn't matter how much of an inconvenience it is. If he feels something's true as an actor, you stick to it. So I learned some things about standing up for my rights as an actor from him. Um, he, uh, uh, working with him, the story, the Brandon Lang character, <laughs> the, that betting underworld, the pressure that was on this guy at the end, you know, that, that you can have these such incredible hot streaks. I've got, a, I've got a brother that went 20, it was on a 27 and two <laughs> run. Yeah, oh, man. And, and of course, when that happens, all your friends start coming around, right? right. Oh, well, of course, he, you know, piled on, started, you know, quadrupling the size of the bet and rode it right into zero dollars. But it's the, it, the great thing about betting is that when, when, you, when you win, you knew it. Mm -hmm. Of course. When yeah. you lose, well, it was just an aberration. It was a glitch. Must have right. referee must have called something. You know, even if you even if you win one and lose two, and the science of that math says you're a loser <laughs> on percentage wise, you know those are those two losses. You think they were just a glitch. That one win is where you had your finger on the pulse of the game, 
And that's, that's why, look, that's why Vegas is growing. That's why uh, Reno is growing. And that's why online gambling will continue to grow. And one day, probably be in most every state. Yeah. Are you a yells at the referee kind of guy? I mean, are you a guy that will take a bad call with you three or four days after a Texas loss? Or, no. or do you just win as win, loss as loss? Let's move on. Um, look, I've got a term called the, 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 the Vegas foul. <laughs> where, you, <laughs> you know, know you don't have to say anymore. Where the gig is in. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. Um, but no, I don't really, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't really take with me. I, I, I pretty much immediately go to look, and I've seen it happen on the field with players live, even at UT, you get a bad call. We know it's a bad call. Yeah. We were right there and you see players start to get deflated. Come on rep. Well, you, that's wasted energy because you're not winning. Leave that to the coach. You are exhausting, wasting energy on what you've got to do next as a player, especially to get exhausted. And all of a sudden, then all of a sudden you feel like you're a victim to a bad call. And that does nothing to help you go make the next play to win the game. It actually gets you on your heels playing defensively, gives you an excuse in your mind. And if you don't let that, if, as a player, you really cannot let that get into your head. And I've seen it get into players' heads. I've even seen it get into coaches' heads. But if that happens, leave that to the coach. And you have to immediately turn over to what's next. Have you thought about the fact that you and I have not missed an opportunity to watch a single game in person during this whole deal? But yet it feels like I've been separated from the sport for like a decade and how sweet it's going to be whenever this happens to finally be able to sit in those stands, stand on that sideline and see a sport that feels like it was taken away from us for a little while and how much maybe – folks who were kind of lukewarm on college football and college athletics in general beforehand may see a little bit of a coming back to the table factor. Well, I'll say this about sports in general and especially college sports for me. Number one, it's the best reality TV there is. You better believe it. It is there. It is. It has a, a, a plan. It has a set of rules for football's sake. Each, each, each uh, uh, field is 100 yards. It's a certain width. You've got referees, rules, 11 on 11. It plays out better than any drama that can be written in my business. If you look at, the, if you look at our national championship, one of the greatest dramas ever on TV when Texas beat USC. If you watch the movement of that game, that couldn't have been written in a Hollywood script. It would have been called fictional. It would have been called sensationalized. But it happens in real time. And it's happening but with, with, with young athletes that are doing everything they can. Young athletes that will make mistakes. Young athletes that will be, turn out and do something greater than they even believe they could do. Young athletes that maybe didn't quite believe in the first quarter, by the third quarter, felt a half a step quicker than they've ever run. And were a half a step quicker than they've ever run. So what I love, I could go on and on about what I love about sports, but it's also – Society can learn so much about sports yeah. and competitiveness. It is the purest and best form of tribalism. It is real tribalism where, yes, I want to beat you, and yes, you want to beat me, and yes, wave your banner, and yes, I'm booing you. But after the game, we walk over and shake hands. Yep. The great thing about sport, compete like hell and do everything you can to beat the opponent and win right now. But when it's over, we go, see you next time. It's a beautiful thing about sports. We can learn, so all of society can learn a lot about that from sports. And a lot of people still have some learning to do about <laughs> that from sports. All right, so we wrap it up here. We got a, a pretty big audience. You got a massive audience that follows whatever you do. Got a fairly big audience here. You got a wide range of people. Some of them are out of school right now. Some of them are out yeah. of a job. Some of them are wondering if they're going to have a paycheck come to them the next two weeks. So from Matthew McConaughey to anyone watching right now, what is the message? Just keep living, man. And that's a different thing for different people right now in ways that you just, you just said it. Look, I sit here in a privileged situation right now. I have a job where I have the money where I don't, I'm not worried about paying my rent this weekend. I have a freezer full of steaks, like I told you at the beginning. All right, I got three kids that are healthy, my wife and I got, and I was able to get my mother, 88 year old mother here to my house. That's a damn privileged situation that I'm, I'm happy to be in. That's not everyone's situation. As I said earlier, you've got people who are out of a job that needed to work this week to pay their rent at the end of the month. you got people that need to put some food on the table. You've got, you got th people with three kids at home that aren't 
healthy like mine. They all have runny noses right now. They're driving them freaking crazy right now. And they feel like they're going to snap. They're trapped in a house with someone that they only like seeing maybe a couple <laughs> hours a day. And now it's about 18 hours a day. Be cool. It's going to take fortitude. It's going to take some strength. No, and just remember this. It's going to pass. And I find that every time we're reminded that, hey, this too shall pass, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, even though we don't know exactly the timeline of when that light is. We've never had a, 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 an enemy like this before. This isn't a 9-11, it's not a World War II. We don't have a, a subject that, we're, that we can see and we said we just eliminate it this way. All we can do right now is defend ourselves against it. Play offense by staying home, which is, seems to be a very defensive move, but it is actually an offensive move right now against this enemy. Wear our mask and go out so we don't spread it as much right now until the people on the front line can stabilize the situation. Doctors and scientists can make sure we got enough beds for when we do re-engage in society. Get it, and we'll come out of this, and the vaccine should be still over a year away. But take care of yourself and take care of your loved ones, and know that if you're taking care of you, you're taking care of me. And if I'm taking care of me right now, guess what? I'm taking care of you. It's a very odd paradox right now. I mean, as separated as we are, we've never been more dependent on each other in any time, and I know in my lifetime. So know that it's gonna end. Uh, tap into that, 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 fifth gear you got, you got it in you to be resilient right now. Um, if you can muster it, you got it in there and rely on, rely on some people around you, rely on your loved ones, get to know your kids better, get to know yourself better, get to know your family better, get to know your, your, your property better <laughs> like I'm doing because I know where the water main line is. I didn't before. Um, and know that, uh, uh, yeah, there's a green light at the end of this red light. Matthew McConaughey, man, it has been a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you. Stay safe. Keep things real in Austin. And finally, when we get games, hope to make it out to see you at the Red River Shootout this year. Hey, let's do it. Y'all be good.